Jesus said, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asks receives, and he that seeks finds, and to him that knocks it shall be opened. Hands tell a great deal about a person. You can tell what type of work one does by their hands. Hardened, calloused hands usually tell the story of hard daily work. Soft hands tell that a person is engaged in another type of work. We also can talk with our hands. A soft touch tells of love, compassion, and concern. The Bible says of Jesus... Then were there brought to him little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come to me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed. A handshake tells of warmth, interest, as well as friendliness. Those who cannot hear nor speak talk with one another by using their hands. Hands write out the news from around the world, write great books, paint masterpieces, sculpture monuments, plow fields, cut timber, mold clay, weave cloth, hammer out steel, and build houses. Of all the tools that man has, hands are his greatest. The picture that the artist is now reproducing is by Germany's most famous artist. This is a picture with an inner meaning. The setting for this picture is Nuremberg, Germany in the 16th century. The mighty impact of the Reformation is beginning to be felt in the little town where the artist of this picture lives and works. He is one of many children in a large family. His father is a very poor Hungarian silversmith. As long as he can remember, he has always wanted to draw and paint. Because his family is poor, he is not able to go to school and study art. He goes to work in his father's craft shop as an apprentice silversmith, but he is still not happy. He wants to be an artist. He dreams of the day when he can leave home and study art. Finally, he gets his chance to go away and study under the guidance of the master teachers. But he must work to make a living at the same time as he studies art. His working hours are long and hard. Also, his study of art is long and hard. He finds it difficult to do both at the same time. Fortunately, he finds a real friend early in his student days a man somewhat older than himself. He, too, is studying art. They decide to live together, work together, and share their hopes and dreams together. But the struggle to learn their art and earn their daily bread is bitterly hard. One night, the two students come home very discouraged. The older student says, Our way of working and trying to study cannot be done. We are not able to make a living nor able to learn about art. If we are to finish our training, we must find a better plan of study. They ask one another, what can we do? Finally, one makes a suggestion. He asked, why not let one of us work to make the living for both of us while the other studies? Then when the one who is studying has finished his training and his work begins to sell, He can take his turn and earn the living for both of us with his art. This looks like a good solution. But who will work first? Neither man wants the other to make such a sacrifice. The younger man says, You must let me work first while you study. I am younger. The older man says, No, it is better that you study first while I work. I already have a part-time job in a restaurant. I can work full-time. You're younger and have far more talent. Your chances of success are far greater than mine. You will finish your work soon. Then when you are finished, I will start. This is the better way. They agree. The older man has his way. 
The younger man goes back to his study of art. He works hard because he knows that he must succeed so his friend can study art also. His older friend goes back to his work as a dishwasher and kitchen worker in order to support them. But training in art is long. Weeks pass, months pass, and years pass before the younger man completes his long and hard training in art. The older man works long, hard hours at washing dishes and scrubbing floors. But he serves gladly, for he is looking forward to the day when he can draw again. Finally, the glad day comes. The young artist gets his first money from selling his artwork. He comes home with the good news and lays the money before his friend as a love offering. Look, my work is beginning to sell, he says. I have here the money from the sale of my woodcuts, and I have the promise of more. You must give up your work and take up your training in art again. I can now make our living with my art. Gratefully, his friend leaves his hard work in the kitchen and returns to the artwork he has so long neglected. But he discovers that he cannot take up where he left off in his training. The long years of hard work have hardened his muscles, enlarged his joints, and stiffened his fingers. He can no longer hold his brushes with skill. He has lost his painter's eye, the painter's touch. His art he is gone forever. He keeps his secret from his young friend. But one night, the younger man comes home unexpectedly. He walks quietly up the steps. He stops at the door of his friend's room. He hears a voice inside. At first, he thinks his friend is talking with a visitor. But he hears only the voice of his friend. He is praying. He hears his prayer and realizes that his friend can no longer draw or paint. He quietly pushes open the door and sees, as if in a picture frame, what you see here, the hands of his friend folded in prayer. He realizes the world will never see the pictures those hands might have painted. Suddenly, a great thought comes to the young artist. I can never restore the skill of those hands, but I can help the world to see and feel the gratitude that is in my heart. I will paint his hands as they are now, folded in prayer. People may never see his painting, but they will see the love and devotion of his hands. I will call my picture Praying Hands. This picture is Albert Durer's tribute to his friend, whose work, sacrifice, and prayers made it possible. What kind of hands do you have? Hands can be filled with blood and sin. You can use your hands for the wrong things. When Cain killed his brother Abel, there was blood on his hands. When King David sent his servant Uriah into battle and committed adultery with Uriah's wife, there was blood on his hands. When Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent of any crime, he took a bowl and washed his hands of the entire matter, seeking to escape responsibility for the death of Jesus. But there was still blood on his hands. Are your hands clean today? The Bible says... He that hath clean hands and a pure heart shall see God. Sin stains your hands. It stains your heart. God teaches that a person who hates his brother has sinful hands. The adulterer has sinful hands. The one who lies has sinful hands. If you have sinned just once, you have become a sinner. Outwardly, you may have covered up your sins like one who slips a clean glove over a dirty hand. But God looks beyond the surface. God looks deep. God looks on the heart. He knows the sin in your life. 
the lust in your mind, the moral decay of your heart, God knows. And God who is holy, God who is pure, God who is absolutely just must punish sin. The punishment for sin is everlasting death, separation from God. The word of God says the wages of sin is death. The soul that sins shall die. This is spiritual death, eternal death, a death in hell, a death that will separate you from God forever. Sin-filled hands cannot come into the presence of a perfect God. But here is good news for you today. God loves you and wants to forgive your sin, cleanse your hands, and to give you a wonderful new life. The hands of Jesus made the universe, the world, and you. The Bible says, all things were made by him and for him. You were made by Jesus and for Jesus. God loved you so much that he sent Christ to pay the penalty for your sins. Jesus did this by dying on the cross for you. It was at the cross that your penalty was paid. It was at the cross that the hands of Jesus were nailed there for you. Those were the hands that had blessed the little children. Those were the hands that had made the blind to see, the lame to walk, and the deaf to hear. Those hands had even made the world and everything in it. Those hands had even created you. Now those hands on the cross were nail-scarred to save you and make you clean before Almighty God. Right now, those hands of Jesus reach out to you. Jesus stands with hands reaching out to you to save you and make you clean. But you must respond. You must come with outstretched hands in repentance and faith. Repentance is simply taking those sin-filled hands from where you have been hiding them and opening them before God, saying, Lord, I have sinned, and I am ashamed of my sin, and I now turn from sin to you. Faith is reaching out to Christ to receive forgiveness of your sins, cleansing from your sins, and a new life by receiving Jesus into your heart as your personal Lord and Savior. Reach out to Jesus. He is reaching out to you. How does one become a Christian? First, you must realize that God loves you and wants you to have a wonderful new life. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Second, you must confess your sin to God. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means that all men are sinners. God compares all men with Jesus Christ, his son. Are you as good and perfect as Jesus Christ? No one is as good as Jesus it is sin that separates you from God the Father. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, which is spiritual separation from God. That is a death in eternity. It is a death in hell. Third, God's good news is that Jesus Christ died on the cross that you might have this new life. Jesus died on the cross for you. He bridged the gap from God to man. God showed his love for you by sending Christ to pay the penalty for your sin. Jesus took your sin, your death, your judgment, and your place on the cross. He became your substitute. Then after three days in the grave, he came back from the dead. In this way, God has clearly shown that he loves you. God loves you personally. The Bible says, God showed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This new life in Jesus Christ is a free gift from God. You cannot get it by just living a good life. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Fourth, the good news from God is is that by receiving Christ 
as your Lord and Savior, you have this new life. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. To receive Christ means turning from sin and self to Christ and trusting him to forgive your sins, to remove the guilt, and to give you a wonderful new life. It means to make Jesus Christ the Lord in your life. You receive Christ by personal invitation. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That is the door of your heart, the door of your life. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. Through prayer, receive Christ by faith right now. Begin a new life in Christ right now. Turn from sin to Christ. God says in his word, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That whosoever includes you, if you will turn from your sin and place your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and ask him into your life and heart right now. Prayers, simply talking with God. Ask Jesus to come into your heart and life right now. To receive Jesus into your heart and life, you can pray to him and say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I'm willing to turn from my sin. I believe you died on the cross to take away my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Take control of my life and make me into the kind of person you want me to be. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you.